The purpose of Matthew's genealogy is to mark Jesus' lineage firmly in Israelite tradition. Our soon-to-be-born king of kings, he isn't an alien brought in to disrupt the human narrative. Jesus is the culmination, the rightful heir to the Israelite nation. His ancestors are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Boaz, Jesse, and kings like David and Solomon, the patriarchs of a grand tradition. The great pillars, pillars of our faith which stand to reason that Jesus will become a pillar of our faith for future generations. And Matthew knows what he's doing. He's opening his gospel by setting the stage that this baby being born matters. Jesus comes with a tradition and he is the fulfillment and the hope for the future of God's chosen people. So I know when we read it, it sounds boring, but it's anything but. It's also important to note that this is not the only genealogy in the Bible. The Old Testament is full of genealogies. And the family unit, where you come from, it matters to the ancient Hebraic circles. When you are named, you are named as the son of your father, who is named as the son of his father and the son of his father and so on. So the use of genealogies in Matthew 1, that's not what makes this important. It's the names that get brought into the genealogy that I find amazing. When you drill down into the genealogy, something emerges that's not quite right. You get the names of five women. Why? Genealogies, 99% of the time, were named through the father's family. Women, in biblical times, were subjugated to a far lesser role than men. So rarely, and I mean rarely, do women even get named. So why this is, is probably a Bible sto study for another day. But just knowing this detail and the list of 39 generations in Matthew 1 include five women's names is important. Five. That's a lot. I mean, it's not a lot, but considering the circumstances and the culture, it is a lot. And it's so blatantly obvious the listeners and the readers of Matthew, they would have seen this detail immediately. I mean, they would have thought, what are these names doing in here? Who are these women? And what significance do they hold when you prop them up next to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David? Let's find out. And we need to get to know these five women. The five, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, the wife of Uriah, who's not named, but we all know her as Bathsheba, and Mary. Let's start with the first, Tamar. She's introduced to us in Genesis 38. It is not a story you would read to your grandkids. But everyone, as they get older, needs to study and to be familiar with who Tamar is. Her story is awful. I'll just briefly say, Tamar was chosen to be the wife of of Judah's oldest son, Ur. He was supposed to have a son through Tamar. Ur didn't live. So Judah made his next oldest son, Onan, marry Tamar. But he died before she could have a baby. They had a third son, Shelah. He was supposed to fill the role of dad and help Tamar have a baby. But he wasn't old enough yet. So Tamar had to go live with her, his, her father-in-law until the youngest son was old enough to marry. Long story short, Tamar conceives twins, but the father is her father-in-law Judah. He then tries to kill her, but she outsmarts him and ends up living and raising her two sons on her own. Genesis 38 is a story of attempted murder and incest. 
it did not have to be mentioned in Jesus' genealogy. We could have moved right over that part of the family story. So why did it make it into the text? Hold that thought. The second woman is Rahab. She is a prostitute. And you can read all about her in Joshua chapter 2. As the story goes, Joshua sends two spies into Jericho before they take the city and move into the promised land. The spies come to Jericho, they get inside the city, and they meet Rahab, and they stay the night with her. The king of Jericho learns of this and sends troops to kill the spies. Rahab let lies to the king of Jericho, says that these men, Israelite men, are not there. And she's actually hiding them in her attic. When the king's men leave, Rahab tells the spies that she knows that they are from God and that this is God's people's land. She protects them, provides shelter for them, gives them a safe route to leave the city. You may have heard the phrase Rahab's rope. That's how she helps the spies escape out the window. And that's the story. She didn't have to be included in in Jesus' genealogy either. So why was she? Hold that thought. The third woman is Ruth. It's the same Ruth as the book of the Bible in the Old Testament. This might seem less scandalous as incest and prostitution, but it's not really. There was a widowed woman named Naomi who had two sons and they married Moabite women. Both sons died. And Naomi told her daughter-in-laws to go back to your homeland, go back to your parents and live. Now one did, but Ruth stayed. She wanted to live with her mother-in-law. And this is where we get the famous line from Ruth 1.16. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. As the story progresses, Naomi, the mother-in-law, introduces Ruth to a distant relative named Boaz. Ruth wanted to marry Boaz, so she seduces him one night while he's inebriated and passed out on the bed. When he wakes up, he's confused, and he tries to find another family member to take Ruth as his wife. When he can't, he does what he thinks is noble, and he marries Ruth himself. So now we have incest, attempted murder, prostitution, and seduction, all playing out in Jesus' genealogy. Again, this story did not have to be mentioned. This is not an exhaustive list in Jesus' genealogy. There are other stories that got skipped over. So why did these make the cut? Hold that thought. The fourth woman isn't named, but we know who she is. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Uriah is the army general to King David. He's the right-hand man to the throne. One day, David sees Uriah's wife taking a bath on a roof. So he commits adultery, then feels bad about it, but instead of telling his best friend what he had done, he demands his best friend go to the front of the line of battle to secure his death so then David could then marry his best friend's widow. King David sentences his best friend to death so he can marry his wife after committing adultery so no one would find out. And this is the mother of King Solomon. So now, We have incest, attempted murder, prostitution, seduction, and added to the litany, adultery radiating from the pages of Jesus' genealogy. Why? Why include these narratives into the lineage of Jesus? There is a lot of speculation as to why. You should think deeply about it yourself. But what if? And this is what I think. Even right here from the beginning of Matthew's gospel, what if the Spirit of God is showing us that Jesus isn't going to be the kind of king that's like all the other kings? 
You know, the King David kind of kings, the army general, the take no prisoner kind of kings. Sure, Jesus is the culmination of these pillars of our faith, but what if he is here to expand the definition of king? I mean, that's what he does, right? The kingdom he brings to earth isn't what we thought it would be. He brings a heavenly kingdom of love and inclusion, not hate or division. And Jesus represents not just the orderly, chosen, cookie-cutter, privileged kind of people. He represents the people on the margins. Blessed are the outcast, the disenfranchised, the lowly, the poor. Blessed are the meek. Jesus is always standing with the people on the margins. Always. He never represents the powerful and the privileged alone. He's always ushering in space for the powerless and the underprivileged. And whether it's subconscious for Matthew or not, I think we're getting a glimpse into this deep truth when we read the genealogy. Because however subtle it may be, it is right here in Matthew 1. Jesus isn't just for the Abrahams, Isaacs, and Jacobs. He is also here for the Ruths and the Rahabs and the Tamars of the world and everyone in between. To me, this is really good news because the way that we try to declassify and to diminish humanity of others, Jesus does not. His kingship is a kinship. He invites all people no matter who they are, into the fold and family of God. And to prove it, some of the most scandalous stories of the Old Testament get dropped right here at the beginning of the story of Jesus. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And it just goes to show us all that when it comes to salvation, Jesus is the Messiah for all people, which includes you and all of your baggage and all of your wickedness, and all of your failings, and all of your dread, Jesus is the Messiah even for you. As Matthew 1.1 says, an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus is ushering in a new kingdom. And this new kingdom starts on the margins, bringing those who would normally be relegated to the shadows of history. And he positions them up and against the pillars of our faith. Jesus' genealogy is one that reminds us all that we all belong. We all matter. No matter how scandalous or broken or pitiful or wasteful or tumultuous our lives have become, we still belong. We're still included. Jesus' kingship is a kinship. And we see this clearly in the fifth woman of the genealogy, Mother Mary. She is an absolute nobody. But when it comes to reading her story in Luke 2, she becomes one of the greatest humans in the story of humanity. She is at the top of the pillars of our faith. And she is a nobody from nowhere. I could be wrong, but I think this is why these women are included. I think it's for us to see that Jesus' kingship is a kinship, and it includes all of us. This Advent, our theme is Hark a Voice is Calling. The voice that called throughout the generations is now calling even to you. You aren't too broken, you aren't too cruel. God is calling you this Christmas. You are another part of the great story and the great lineage of Jesus. You matter. You belong in the family of God. So let me ask, what's the voice of God saying to you?